And then secondly, dot com. Make sure listener, you touch, share, <laughs> like, tweet, whatever you do, do it online. We're available everywhere. David, thanks for taking your time out on homebabiz.com. Okay, no problem. Thanks for the call. Connect, capitalize, go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our share all promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. Inside the mind of the owner, radio for small business, connect, capitalize, go. It's radio for small business. Your host, Eugene Rowe on homebabiz.com. You can check out the show, not just at homebabiz.com, but on Google Play, iTunes. I think it's on YouTube. We've got a little speaker, soundcast, and anywhere there's sound available, you can check it out. Right now, today, I've got a young lady who knows how to make things happen. She's got all the swag in your bag. Swagessentials.com owner, Miss Lydia Evans. Welcome to radio for small business. Oh, thank you for having me, Eugene. I appreciate it. So tell us, you know, I remember you from ABC Shark Tank. I, that's where I remember you from. You went on to the show, but I don't want to talk about that yet. I want to talk about your background and how you got to starting business first. Tell us about that. Okay, well, I started in business many years ago, actually nine years ago, making a ladies' line called La Bella Doche. I and mean, it was like your handcrafted sugar scrub, lotions. And my focus was for people that had sensitive skin like myself because I'm a sufferer of eczema. Hmm. And so I just made a bunch of natural products that were enriched with different oils and tinctures and hydrosols that help people like myself that had eczema. So that was my initial start was actually solution to my own skincare gotcha. issues. Gotcha. And as time went along, I became a licensed esthetician where I really, really studied and learned skincare by the book. So I just mixed the two and here I am. Wow. And eventually, I mean, now you've got a product that Forbes magazine calls the coolest gift for travelers. How was it getting that Absolutely. designation? Oh, that was awesome. As a matter of fact, I found out by accident. That That's so funny. A lot of the press we get, I find out by accident <laughs> because it's like every once in a while I'll Google myself, which when I did it right after Shark Tank, everybody said, don't Google yourself, don't Google yourself. But I did. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, all these people that have gotten the product have wrote up on it. That's amazing. So I didn't find out about it until well after the journalist had wrote about it being the coolest gift for travelers. And she did that around the holiday. And then this past Father's Day, from a complete completely different journalist at Forbes. She named us the coolest gifts. I mean, the best gift for Father's Day. Wow. It was awesome. Well, yeah. that's pretty cool. I mean, you got so much stuff going on. It's like, okay, Forbes writes mm -hmm. you up and you don't even know about it. It's just business as usual, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So tell us about, I mean, obviously, when you go on to shows like ABC Shark Tank, you're attempting to raise capital from investors. And in this case, it's the sharks. Tell us about the mindset you had going up to preparing to pitch investors for your business. Okay, well, before I even left Houston, Texas, I told my mother and my father, there's two things I'm not going to do. I'm not going to get an attitude and embarrass my family name on that. So <laughs> TV if they turn me down. Good idea. That was the first thing. And the second thing was I'm not going to cry. <laughs> Only because I just feel like um, there's business and then there's emotion and the two don't need to cross. Gotcha. So when I went out there, I went out there with a very fixed mindset of I'm going to go tell them the honest to God's truth, even though I know I didn't have, you know, but $54,000 in sales. I'm going to tell them the honest to God's truth. I'm going to tell them my numbers and I'm going to stand behind them firmly. I'm going to say I 
did fifty four thousand dollars in sales as if I did a million. Right. Because I feel like to sell a fifty four thousand dollars in one bar of soap by yourself out of the truck of your car was a feat to me. So I went out there with all the confidence like I had a multi million dollar brand. But that doesn't mean that I didn't want to faint while I was on that stage. Right. Because it's very real. It's extremely real. So there's no pre-taping. There's none of that. You take one time and that's all you get. So Whoa. when people saw me on TV on December 5th, that was the first time I saw myself. Wow. So yeah. just in case you're just tuning in, we're talking to Lydia Evans, owner of SwagEssentials.com. SwagEssentials.com. Now, mm-hmm. you, yeah. I'm saying SwagEssentials.com right now and they're on radio yeah. for small business. But Lydia, you've got a cool story about when you went on to the show, you didn't necessarily have yeah. that domain name yet, did you? No, I did not. I actually tried to get it, but it was taken. There was some little teenager, like a 15-year-old kid, (laughs) that had like a little online store for T-shirts. And uh, when I tried to contact them, they were like, no, it's not for sale or whatever have you. Neither here nor there. I went ahead and took the domain Pure dash flag because I felt like, okay, pure to play off is the fact that, you know, our tagline is grooming by pure design because all of our products are natural and, and made with pure ingredients. And then SWNG, which is an acronym for our full name, soaps, washes, and grooming. Hmm. So we took the name pure-swag.com as a domain. Well, shortly after we got that and we aired on Shark Tank, all of a sudden I get an email from an anonymous man. He said he wanted to stay anonymous. And he said, hey, why are you promoting pure-swag and not your domain? That's bad for branding. So then, of course, you know, my first response was like, no, 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 duh. Like, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, really? I'm like, I know that. Do you think I would just purposely go get this name if it was available? So I responded back, sir, it's not available, but thank you so much for your feedback, and, and I appreciate that. And so he responds back and says, well, it was up for sale in February, and I have been monitoring it ever since. Wow. And I bought it, and I'm willing to transfer it over to you. Well, of course, because right after Shark Tank, everybody is connecting themselves to my pockets as fast as possible. I'm like, <laughs> oh, this man is going to try to sell me this domain name for right. thousands of dollars. But it has value to my brand, and I was literally preparing myself to do that. But by the grace of God, he responded back, and he said, I'm not asking you for anything. I love I love you. I love your personality. I think you're going to go far, even without a shark. Your product's great. I do definitely want to remain anonymous in this. However, I would like to just transfer it over to your company, and I'll pay for everything. What? And I thought it was a joke. Really? I was like, wow, <laughs> what an angel. Yes. And I was like, what an angel. And I was like, sir, we can send you a check made out, just blank. You can put your own name in there. And he was like, no, no need to. Wow. And he and he sent me back an email like, this is some good marketing advice for you. And you know, I do this professionally for a living. And I think these are some tips you can apply. And best of luck with your with wow. your um That's your, amazing. Your business. And I was like, wow, yeah. Wow. So I guess, you, you know, you, you sow those good seed and eventually something comes back to you. And this guy, I mean, he probably could have sold it on the market for at least five ten thousand dollars i'm guessing and easy and i bought it yeah wow <laughs> so we're talking yeah, to lydia he, evans owner of swagessentials.com right here on radio for small business you can check the show out on homebabiz.com google play itunes and many many more places even twitter and facebook lydia you mentioned something and let's switch a little bit because obviously you came off the show you've got some marketing publicity and you mentioned something that people were trying to attach themselves to your pockets tell us about some of the things you got to do to prepare yourself even for after the show for you know the good people and the not so good ones well life changes immediately i mean they you know when you go there you have a team of people that kind of trying to you know they kind of give you some little tips here and they're like just know that regardless of how this goes, as long as you your product is quality and you're a likable person, you will be successful. However, without a deal, only a certain percentage of people and a very small percentage are successful because you don't have that capital in advance. Hmm. And I was one of those people. I did not have the capital in advance because, for one, I didn't get a shark. And for two, I just didn't have enough to so into my brand to get me out of my apartment. Okay. And so for me, it was a very unique situation because my product is very niche. So after I left there, I got thousands. And when I say thousands, I mean thousands of emails and phone calls from people that said they saw me on the show. They were so motivated by me. They loved the fact that I stood up and I represented my brand and I didn't fold over. I didn't show any sadness. I say, well, thank you. And I'll take that and raise you one. And it was women and men from around the world that had such positive, great feedback. 
But then also, of course, with that comes people that feel like, oh, I know if I was her, I would do this. <laughs> if I was her, I'd have done that. Yeah, it's a very shoulda, coulda, woulda situation because it's unnerving to stand in front of five multi, 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 multi millionaires right. that in your mind you feel hold your brand's livelihood in their yay or nay of an investment. Hmm. Now, of course, that's how I felt then. But afterwards, when the orders came in and they flooded me and I'm looking at my second bedroom and I'm looking in the closet where I would make my products and I, I look in there, I see a hundred soap bars and we sold 10,000 units in four hours. Ouch. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was very overwhelming, but it was so humbling. I think I literally, the first three days after that, I did not sleep, Eugene. Oh. I, I literally... No, I was like a zombie because I, I was so, it felt so unreal. It felt like I was living someone else's life. Wow. Every time you turn around, if someone's on the phone wants to interview me. Someone wants to talk to me. Someone wants the product. I mean, it was crazy. People were like, oh, um, yeah, I'm trying to find out where I can go pick the product up. Well, we didn't have any retail locations but my brother's <laughs> shop. And he said when he went to his shop the next day, it was a line wrapped around the corner of Ouch. people waiting on him to go to his shop. He didn't have enough inventory. You <laughs> I mean, know, he had so, 100, 100 so, bars in the closet, right? So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And the, what they didn't understand was when people saw me in December, they thought, oh, she just taped this. That It doesn't happen like that. I didn't just take that thing and walk off the stage. So people were like, how are you going to go on Shark Tank? And you're not prepared. And I'm like, sweetheart, I, I had no financial injection in my business. Right, right. And I'm doing the best I can. So I had to literally take off that, yay! I got I got able to be featured on Shark Tank. I had to take that hat off and put on my humble business person hat and literally take these calls of people that are saying, so what do you mean I'm not going to get my product for a month? Oh, man. What do you mean I'm not going to? So I had to express it to people. And you'd be amazed at how many people were like, oh, I didn't realize that. Right. Oh, I, just, I don't know why I thought you'd have just had thousands of units sitting up waiting. It I don't know why they think like every that. business owner has, you know, a million dollars of product sitting in the basement ready to move. Yeah. It, even waiting. if you had the yeah. injection, you probably wouldn't have set it all in a million dollars of inventory, I'm but, guessing. No, no, because you can't top your funds like that. But that's all the ins and outs and the little pieces of business and entrepreneurship that, um, you know, you, you that's not textbook stuff there. That's stuff you kind of got to learn right. as you go along. Right, yeah. right. Well, I've definitely enjoyed learning from you. We've been talking to Lydia Evans of SwagEssentials.com right here on Radio for Small Business. You can check us out, HomeBizz.com. Do us a favor. When we put this show on, like it, share it, tweet it, whatever you can do to yeah. it. Because, uh, Lydia, I, I really wish you much success. Why don't you give the listeners a way to get a hold of you? Absolutely. You can go to our website website, which is swagessential.com. You can also find us on pretty much every social media platform. On Facebook, we're on swag at Swag Essentials, one full word. On Twitter, and I also have an Instagram. Everyone loves to connect with me on Instagram. And then that is at swag underscore essentials. And that's the Twitter and the Instagram. And as far as if you want to get in contact with me personally or you have a question for me, you want to connect with me personally, go to our website, hit up the contact form, put your purpose of contact in there. And if I don't contact you back directly, my customer care manager or my assistant will. Awesome. Lydia Evans, SwagEssentials.com. Thank you for taking your time out here on HomeBiz.com. Thank you, Eugene. Have a great day. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our share all promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. All 
It's Radio for Small Business. Your host, Eugene Rowe. Check us out on homebabiz.com. That's H-O-M-B-A-B-A-Z dot B-I-Z dot com. I better spell it right myself. Nevertheless, if I get it wrong, someone's going to get me organized to get it right. Miss Angela Cody, owner of Major Mom, is on the show. Angela, welcome. Thank you, sir. It's good to be on your show. Now, Major Mom, those are two words that normally don't go together. So you got to tell us what's up. Well, I was a major in the Air Force. Really? And went, yes, I was in the United States Air Force sir, for almost 14 years. I had a baby girl when I was a major in the Air Force. I would get home from duty, and my husband would say, Major Mom is home. <laughs> and then my son was born 18 months later, and I decided that military life and motherhood were no longer compatible so I resigned my commission and got out to be an entrepreneur of all things. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so getting out of the military 14 years is a major. First of all, thank you for your service. I really appreciate that. Welcome. That was obviously a big switch from a lot of structure in the military to an entrepreneur. Tell us some of the things that went through your head. Tell us some of the ping pong that might have gone through your head. In the military, you know, you really are told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. So you don't really have to do a lot of thinking for yourself. However, there are times when the best made plans go awry. And I think that's where I was taught the skills that I'm now using in the entrepreneur world because you have a plan B for any mission. And many people know that that plan goes to pot pretty quickly in some, you know, some arenas. And then you need to adapt, overcome, use everything you know to make sure the mission gets met. And I think, wow, that is so much like entrepreneurship because you have this idea and these goals and you're going to have this many clients to make this much revenue and you have your projections and all the fancy schmancy plans mm-hmm. and then they don't <laughs> They work. don't work like that, do they? <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to start going, okay, plan B. Oh, plan C, plan D. And then we're already at plan you know, not what will be <laughs> right now. Now, when it comes to, you know, being flexible, because flexibility is a major key for an entrepreneur. And I know a lot of people who haven't taken that steps. That's that step. That's a major thing for them. Were you naturally uh, that flexible as far as making backup plans? Or is it something that you purely learned in the military? I grew up in the most chaotic environment in terms of moving 16 times by the time I was 14. My dad was in construction. My mom was a nurse. And sometimes we'd have literally five or six hours to get our house packed up and move. Wow. And that wow. Just really created a ton of flexibility in terms of my relationship with time and stuff and, you know, attachments to things. I think that then the military does the same thing because you move, you switch units, you switch squadrons. And even though the mission is changing in each of those units, there's still some standard operating procedures that you can cling to. And I think that's why I created Major Mom, because I saw people being really organized at work in the corporate environment, but they were totally disorganized in their business or their home, their office, you know, not invoicing people, um, just not being on top of their game with good time management. And that's why eight years ago we started this organizing company to help others really keep their act together, if you will, because I don't know if you agree with me, Eugene, but I think that being organized is a critical skill in entrepreneurship. I agree. I agree 100%. In fact, we're talking to Miss Angela Cody, owner of Major Mom. She helps uh, individuals, businesses get organized with her business, uh, United, former United States Air Force officer, and we're talking about the importance of organization to entrepreneurship. Angela, give us a couple more tips or maybe some things that just being organized could help a business owner do. Being organized in general, I think, requires you to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. So some people listening today may be really good at organizing their numbers. They might be good at organizing their papers. Or maybe they aren't organized at all, so they still try to be their own bookkeeper, still try to be their own assistant and create their own file systems and never reach out for help. So my first big thing is entrepreneurship is not meant to do alone. It's meant to outsource and gather other people that have great 
obstacles that you do in certain areas hmm. so that you can do what you're super good at versus spending lots of time in the office doing something you hate doing. Right. And you know what? There are businesses out there where the owner actually works for the guy he hired as a CEO or the girl they hired as a CEO just because the owner knows his limitations. And uh, I think that's a great piece of advice. What are some other things that you found that simply being organized can do to help uh, help entrepreneurs succeed? Well, being organized in terms of your office and your life, it saves you time, money, and energy. A lot of business owners that we organize have duplicate purchases on so many levels, which is such a waste of time, whether it's two or four printers, you know, gadgets and gadgets. Um, guess what's the thing I find the most in offices, disorganized offices, when we go to organize them. And these are solopreneurs or maybe a few people, companies. It's software the magic bullet they buy all this software and it sits on the shelf and never gets open no or no <laughs> that never get open and their offices are full of stuff that they think if i just read this book if i just get this software if i just sign up for this program and or if i just go to 10 more networking events i'll have you know 200 <laughs> business cards that i can throw in a box and do nothing with oh man and that's my second thing is do something with those business cards otherwise just stay home yeah you'll save a lot of time i think i read a stat over up to 80 percent of uh networking events and trade show leads go unfollowed up on which is kind of crazy so we're, we're talking to angela cody she's owner of major mom she is an organizer extraordinaire former air force major that's an officer i think uh angela we've been on the process of talking about organization and one of the things that businesses have to get organized as for is when it comes to raising capital and, and bringing in investors. Have you ever raised capital at all? Oh, goodness, I have raised capital. I've been on Shark Tank. I've, I've done pitch competitions all over the United States. And let me tell you how organized you have got to be for those <laughs> types of events. You need to know your numbers inside and out. You've got to have an organized business plan, which means your thoughts really have to be organized before you go out and raise capital because anybody going to invest in your company is going to sense or see or witness this organization if you show up that way. And really? Most people do not like to invest in disorganized people unless they do have a team supporting them. Like you said, the technician, somebody who's really good at what they do, surrounding themselves with bookkeepers, CPAs, hmm. CFOs, hmm. so of the like. But yeah, I've had a lot of experience raising capital. And it really is a full-time job if you're going to go out there and, and get the money that you need. Wow. So you said something. Investors don't like to invest in people who are disorganized. What are, are Is there a general theme that you see when you do pitch competitions or, or talk to investors? Is there something general that they all want to know? I think they, the one thing that I see a lot is they, they want to know the numbers inside and out. But but the, beyond the numbers, because those are all over the board in terms of how good somebody is at, at what you know they do in producing those numbers. But what I notice is the main question that investors seem to get at is, why are you doing this business? Why should we invest in you? And it, a lot of questions really get to the heart of the entrepreneur and why they're doing what they're doing. Does mm. that make sense? Like they, they're like, yeah, yeah, we can read the numbers and we'll verify those in the bank accounts and, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll verify all that good stuff. But what we can't verify is what's or, motivating you. Know, what is motivating you? And I have saw so many people give pitches to raise capital, show up disorganized. I can't tell you how many people show up to Shark Tank without all of the things that they need oh, no. stuff for their set. Oh, no. It's a disaster to watch. Oh, man. We've been talking to Angela Cody, owner of Major Mom. She's been in multiple pitch contests. She's been on ABC's Shark Tank. Angela, why don't you tell the listeners the website and how they can get a hold of you? Okay. Our website is majormom.biz, and they can go straight to the website, click contact us. If anybody out there listening has some questions about organizing their home office or just entrepreneurial questions in general, we have a, a question button on our website. If you hit contact us, it, that questions will be directed directly to me, and I can 
uh, spend a few seconds with you and help you out because getting organized is not a luxury. It's a necessity. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. Angela Cody, owner of Major Mom, thanks for taking your time out on HomeBabiz.com. Thank you so much. I hope you have a majorly organized day. Connect. Capitalize. Go. new radio for business it's the podcast for business Screw that i'm not doing people's lunch dishes <laughs> highlighting the best emerging talent oh my god all these people that have gotten the product and wrote up on it that's amazing the podcast for business live every weekday at 4 30 p.m eastern if i think positive about the results only positive results are going to come to me you never know what you'll hear if we didn't have that foundation i don't think i would have had the balls well, but <laughs> you I, can say it. It's, it's, we're on the um, internet. It's, cool. it's okay. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't have had the guts to do that. To do that. Connect. Capitalize. Go. All new radio for small business. Do you remember how it felt? How awesome it felt to receive a real handwritten note in the mail from a friend. Tomer Alpert of Felt is bringing that feeling back. Tomer Alpert, welcome to Radio for Small Business. Thanks for having me. Hey, uh, why don't you tell us what Felt is? I had a chance to visit the website. I think it's really cool. But why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about your business? Sure. So Felt is an iPhone and iPad app that lets you send personal handwritten cards in the mail. You simply select your card. Then you get to handwrite your message. You can use your finger or a stylus. And then we print that card on premium paper and mail it for you. We hand apply a stamp and take it to the USPS within 24 hours. So I can already see where this would make my life a lot easier. My wife likes to send cards, you know, after almost everything that we do. Okay. So where'd the idea even come from? Where'd you, where'd you come up with this thing? So my wife and I, Gracie, went to a uh, dinner party one night and on the way home, she wanted to send the host a thank you card and the stores were all closed. We had no idea where our stamps were. And I thought, you know, there just has to be an app by now that lets you do this. <laughs> so we went onto the app store and the only apps that existed let you type your message. And then they printed your little like text message onto a card. And we just didn't feel that was very personal. Hmm. So we got really excited and, you know, basically went to work the next day on creating felt, building our team and starting this journey. Wow, just like that, for, so from a party, you know, wanting to be a good guest and saying thank you, you realize there's nothing out there because, of course, there's supposed to be an app for that, right? It wasn't out there, and right. uh, you came up with the idea. So I heard you say you and your wife went to work together. So how did you guys kind of get started putting the business together? Uh, did you start working on the app first or the business first? I heard you mention team. What came first for you? Yeah, you know, the first thing that I did was, you know, I wanted to make sure that handwriting could look natural when it was printed. So my school of thought is bootstrap it as far as you can. Do it on your own money with your own resources, you know, before you go out and look for investors. So, you know, we literally downloaded like some art apps that let you draw and then we printed them and we started on that first because we figured that was going to be the hardest part of the, of the whole product. So we found some really interesting ways to make handwriting when it prints look completely authentic. Hmm. And today people email us and they're like, you know, I sent my mom a Mother's Day card and then I called her because I wanted to tell her about cells. And she couldn't understand how the card she received <laughs> was <laughs> from an app. Wow. Because it was their handwriting and it looked so, looked so authentic. And so you, that was the first thing that we did. Hmm. Yep. And then we started building our team. You know, once we, once we figured out we could make a card look real and just replace pen and paper with, with your app and your finger. We started building the team. And the first thing that we looked is like, okay, what don't we do well? Mm. What parts of this business are we going to need to find other people to help us with? And the very first one, you know, I have a lot of experience in entrepreneurship, but never in consumer products and consumer brands. Okay. And I knew from day one that I wanted felt to be a brand that millions of people used. So I quickly looked through my network and within a day found the perfect partner in for felt. And they, are. So we're four co-founders. David and Andrew are the two that we found through our network. And they are you know, brand experts. They're advertising executives and brand launching experts. Wow. So yeah, they helped us put the whole thing together. 
that's crazy because most people would ask themselves, what can I do to save the most money? And you said, what do I not do well? What kind of training or mentality had you developed before then to get you to even ask that question? Yeah, you know, what got me to ask that question was my experience building a startup with my dad, actually. And after high school, I started going to college. And then he approached me and asked if I wanted to help him with his business. So I dropped out of college, uh, quickly helped him start that business, but we started it out of our apartment. And we went through a grueling experience of bootstrapping. We got evicted from two different apartments oh, man. <laughs> um, as we were building the product. But what I learned from my dad was you can literally do so much more than you think you can do with just what you have. And so I carried that mentality into felt and did as absolutely much as we could do on our own. You know, that means all of our savings went into felt, hundreds of thousands of dollars, credit card bills. But beyond that, you know, there's also partnerships. It was like, okay, typically, for instance, our two partners are brand executives and they, they run one of the premier design firms in the country. And typically, you know, I think a lot of people would think, okay, we should raise money so that we can go hire people like that. But I also know that to build a real business, people need to have ownership. Mm. They need to be putting their sweat and tears into it. And you don't do that if you're doing it just as a contractor or as a vendor. Oh, okay. You do that only if it's your business. Gotcha. Yeah. So I made them, you know, full-time partners and felt over a period of time, but that was always the vision. So kind of the like uh, giving them equity, sweat equity, so to speak, I'm guessing. Yeah, sweat equity. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I would call it. Too. Gotcha. So not only that, but you eventually decided, you know, to start raising capital. We all know you were on ABC's Shark Tank. A lot of people think that's just a game show. What's different from the viewer's side that's totally different on the side when you're on the carpet pitching for investors? Yeah, I think the notion that it's a game show is not correct. <laughs> you know, I can say going through the process now, it's legit. The Sharks don't know the companies coming out. You know, their first experience with you, unless they've heard about you, you know, other ways, but typically their first experience is right then and there. <laughs> so, you know, that part is, is real and it's authentic. And I think the other part, you know, the flip side of that is the entrepreneurs going on the show. You know, we especially went on the show when we were ready. Our product was ready. We were out of money. We really needed an investor to give us capital. Hmm. Because we had everything else built. The product was ready to go. The team was ready to go. We figured out all the different issues, right, that you right. figure out along the way. We did all of that on our own dime. And now we were ready to bring on an investor because the investor's risk was dramatically reduced with Felt. You know, Felt wasn't just an idea that had to be built. It was a good idea that had already been built and had already been figured out. You know, we, we actually rebuilt the product three different times wow. because we started when there was a very small iPhone in 2015, and then the bigger iPhones came out, and then the iPad Pro came out, and then Apple built a stylus that lets you handwrite, you know, in a very real way. Hmm. So it so, sounds like, and I didn't want to cut you off, but it, going back to what you just said, it sounds like you spent a lot of time invested a lot of time in building a system a business system so that when you did take it to those sharks you know they would take more note of it just because you were not some guy with a piece of paper and a business plan correct yeah that's right and also it allowed us to value the company with a lot more affirmations with a lot more validation and traction mm -hmm. uh, not just an idea that we say is worth x number of dollars because when it was just an idea we didn't know anything we didn't know if people would even be willing to handwrite something on a screen <laughs> um, so we we validated a lot of assumptions that we had been making and then we could tell our investors you know the reason it's valued at x number of millions of dollars is because we've done you know, these 10 things that yeah. reduce the risk dramatically. So let me ask you this, and you know, this is not a normal question, but if you were had to value the company confidently without building that networking system before you went on Shark Tank, what do you think you would have had to value it at in order to get a shark interested? So we devalued our company when we went on Shark Tank. Wow. When we talked to private investors, it was valued much higher. And, you know, we did that strategically. We wanted to engage the sharks on a positive note. We didn't want to go into Shark Tank and, you know, look greedy. We didn't want to go into Shark Tank from a negotiation standpoint. We wanted to go on there trying to, you know, attract the best investor. Gotcha. And we wanted them to know that 
we're being very upfront. We know they have value beyond just capital. Mm. And so we're valuing that differently than we would if we went to just a normal private investor who can't bring, you know, media exposure partnerships and other things to the table. Right. And so we're just very upfront. That's the great thing about being on the television exposure, right? You probably got access to tens, if not hundreds of millions of people in a single night. <laughs> and uh, I agree with you. I think there is a value to that. So I appreciate you, you really kind of going that angle because I don't know, I talk to people and they still think you just show up, you put some things on a table and the sharks want to give you money. Yeah, you know, we, but it's, I think it's part of our culture at Felt is just to be very upfront, very transparent, very real and honest. And so we, I think we did a really good job of not losing that when we went kind of on to the primetime big stage finally. Cool. Cool. Well, I got to tell you, I do think I'll be going on to Felt a little later today, Tomer. <laughs> And um, I think I'll be sending out some postcards myself. I like the idea of being able to take the picture and put my fingerprints on it and not actually have to find a stamp, find an envelope, and trek over to the post office. Do your customers tell you similar things? Yeah, that's the number one reason people use felt is because it's the perfect marriage of modern-day technology with this tradition. And it's still made to keep the authenticity intact, right? It's still your handwriting. You created it. The only thing that's different is that you never touched the piece of paper. You wow. just used your phone or your iPad in front of you. And I think that, you know, some people still want to go out to the store and get a card and lick the envelope and do something like that. And that's totally fine. That's totally cool. I think we hear like 50-50, like half the people who see felt love it. They think that it's awesome. They think that it maintains enough authenticity to send their mom a Mother's Day card using it. And then the other half of the people are like, no way, Jose, like if, you know, my mom would shoot me if I didn't go to the store. And I think it's interesting that, you know, our perspective as users is that I wouldn't send cards before felt. And so now that I am sending cards, they are in my handwriting. My right. mom loves it, period, <laughs> because before she wasn't getting them in the, at all anyway. <laughs> And it's mom, right? Because mom is going to appreciate it no matter what it is, right? So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I use Felt. Obviously, I'm a little different, but I use Felt for, you know, business interactions. I use Felt for sincere, heartfelt expressions because I just think I've been around this for a long time, and I've thought about this long and hard, and I've decided to put my own money into it, namely because when I handwrite it, no matter if I use my finger on my iPhone or if I use the Apple Pencil on my iPad, or pen and paper. The fact that I actually handwrite my message, I have basically... It's yours. Like it's your agreed. thoughts. It's your idea. It's your spirit, right? Yeah. And it's different than typing your message. It really is. And so I've you know, kind of resolved into my, in myself that this is where the value lies. Wow. And it doesn't matter if you touch the paper or not. What really matters is that you crafted your message in a way that you don't typically do, right? You don't typically handwrite stuff. You don't typically send handwritten notes. So the fact that you did it is what is special. It doesn't matter if you actually went to the store, touched the stamps, did this, did that. What matters is the message exactly. is in your handwriting. Exactly. Well said. Tomer Alpert of Felt. Tomer, why don't you tell the listeners how to find out more information and download your app? Sounds great. Yeah, you can just go to the App Store on your iPhone or iPad, search for Felt, and you'll find us. And actually, right now, we're being featured by Apple. We're the number one Father's Day app selected by them. So you can just scroll down on the home screen of the App Store and see Felt. Sounds great. Tomer Alpert of Felt, thanks for taking your time out on Radio for Small Business. Thanks for letting me, Don. Appreciate it. Connect. Capitalize. Go. It's the podcast for business. Screw that. I'm not doing people's lunch dishes. Highlighting the best emerging talent. Oh, my God. All these people that have gotten the product have rolled up on it. That's amazing. The podcast for business live every weekday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. If I think positive about the results, only positive results are going to come to me. You never know what you'll hear. If we didn't have that foundation, I don't think I would have had the ball. Well, not couple, but <laughs> hey, you I, can say it. It's, it's, we're on the uh, internet. It's, it's okay. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't have had the gut to do that. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our share all promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. Inside the mind of the owner. Radio for small business. Connect. Capitalize. Go. It's Eugene Rowe with Radio for Small Business. Visit homebookis.com for great interviews, tips, tricks, hints, and everything with real entrepreneurs. Connect, capitalize, and go. Okay, this guest built his business from the ground up. It's built by a passionate and driven brother-sister millennial team in their hometown of Carmel, California. Skyler Scarlett, welcome to Radio for Small Business. Yeah, Eugene, thank you so much for having me. Now, uh, Glossy, to be on your show. Oh, you, thank you. You're welcome. Glossy Cryotherapy, that's your business. You guys just had a, a big appearance on national television. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll get into some specifics. Yeah, no, so we, you know, my sister and I, we, uh, you know, found a new therapy in America, and we dove right into it in our hometown, tiny Carmel, California, only has a population of 4,000, but really saw a quick success. And uh, we applied to Shark Tank, I think, when we were seven months in business, and Fortunately for us, we beat out 70,000 other entrepreneurs to appear on Season 7, Episode 20. Wow. And uh, have just kind of taken off ever since. And it's been uh, quite the journey for us so far. So, Skylar, you already said three things I've got to ask about. First of all, you work with your sister. You know, a lot of people have sibling rivalries and things like that. How do you all get along and how do you make the business run? Yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, uh, we're six years apart and when we grew up, we hated each other. So that's a great <laughs> question to ask. <laughs> I think the thing is, uh, we're actually the perfect team. You know, uh, I'm kind of the big dreamer. Who, you know, I think I can open a thousand locations in a year. And she's more reserved and more the container. And, you know, she makes sure that we're organized and balanced and we don't rush into anything. So we kind of balance each other out and we have different strengths. You know, I'm really the, the science guy and, you know, she's very good with paperwork and being organized and uh, marketing. Gotcha. So we kind of have our different areas that we focus on. And you want to have a good entrepreneur team, you need to have both both types of people. Someone who is a big dreamer who really, you know, is very optimistic and then you need to have someone who's more reserved because the combination will, will really balance you out in the right. long term. Right. And I've got to applaud you because I've done business with family before and it was weird because I ended up having to fire them and <laughs> and oh, yeah. it, it, they weren't as motivated as you two were. I mean, where's the drive come from with your business, Glass A Cryotherapy? Yeah, there, there is so much motivation between us both. When we started it, we were both kind of in um, a low spot. You know, I had just been dunked on my college uh, sweetheart. She broke my heart. And, oh, man. You know, I was very motivated to, you know, you know, go out there and conquer the world and succeed. And my sister, you know, had just gone uh, through with a job where she had a horrible experience for three years. You know, she came home crying from her job. And so she was, didn't really know what she was going to do with her life. And we kind of came together and found this crowd therapy and said, hey, this therapy is amazing. Can we make it work? So we, we said, yes, we can. We'll just do it in Carmel and, you know, make this thing, which, which bring cryotherapy to America. So when we started, we were definitely at a low point. But, you know, we both had the motivation to say we want to, you know, we want to have better lives. We want to, you know, fulfill something inside of each other and, you know, make this happen. Wow. That's really where the motivation comes from. So even though two big personal, well, two big personal, I guess, low points, like you said, you know, you had you came out with a great idea, obviously, and then you're in business for seven months and you beat out 70,000 applicants for Shark Tank. What do you think set you all apart from the other 69,993 applicants? Well, yeah, first of all, I think we're lucky to be on such an interesting, you know, therapy that we work with. I mean, first of all, you know, when people say, oh, man, you freeze people for three minutes, it really catches people's attention. 
So first of all, cryotherapy is just different. You know, it, it's a brand new industry here in America. So I don't think they've ever had seen any audition tapes or anybody going there auditioning for cryotherapy. We're probably the first. And then also the fact that we're brother sister and people go, how do you work with your sister? How do you work with your brother? And, you know, we're both very, very passionate. And um, they could see that in our audition video, how passionate we were. And I think we really knocked out of the park with our audition video. It's probably the hardest stage you got to get past when you're playing the Shark Tank. And, you know, we made a good 10-minute video. I, I kind of popped out of the crowd on like a jack in the box. And uh, they told <laughs> us that the producers just loved, loved, loved the video. And I think that's really what set us apart. Hmm. So not only... Are you working with your sister? Not only uh, have you been in business seven months and all of a sudden you get on Shark Tank, but you're also millennials. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say millennials are unmotivated. They're lazy. What do you say to that, knowing that you have a crazily growing business right now? Yeah, I think, you know, millennials are very misunderstood. You know, most of my friends, they all want to own their own businesses and do their own things. And I think a lot of millennials are striving, you know, to get to the point where they can, you know, try to do something on their own. You know, because I do think there's that misconception that we're lazy and we don't care. I can tell you right now that millennials are actually very, very passionate. You know, I just know from my friends that mm. um, we all, they really do. They, we all kind of want to do our own thing and, you know, you know, have a huge impact. Wow. So I, I do like the fact that we're millennials and, you know, we've seen uh, quick success. Hasn't been without, you know, the occasional valleys, which, you know, every entrepreneur will encounter. Right. But um, there's been a lot of peaks, which um, have been fantastic for us so far. So great. Awesome. So now a lot of people think just because you go on Shark Tank, you're a contestant on a TV show, okay? But you're actually pitching a business opportunity, an investment opportunity. Had you guys pitched investors prior to even applying for Shark Tank? No, no, honestly, not not like that. I mean, we have met with so many potential partners and, you know, individuals that are interested in crowd therapy and a few before Shark Tank, but it was never in the capacity that we're really pitching our business for someone to give us a big chunk of money and invest in it. So that was really, you know, our Colossal Cryotherapy is our first business. And I didn't really take any business courses in college and neither did my sister. So we've been kind of learning as we go, but there's no better way to learn than, hmm. you know, <laughs> learning by doing. Yeah. So, On a national television stage, I'd say you're doing a pretty good job of learning. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, thank let's, you. let's talk about the decision because you are pitching a part of your equity when you go onto the show. What was the thought process you all had when you said, okay, we'll part with, you know, X amount of the company? What was going through your, your mind? I guess what was balancing you out to say, we want to do it, but we want to do it right? Yeah, and there's a lot of decisions you have to make. And, you know, we knew we wanted, to, you know, to keep full ownership on our side. But we were willing to give up a lot of equity. I mean, my sister and I, we're not greedy. I mean, of course, we want financial security so we can, you know, support ourselves and our family and our friends. But more so than anything, we're just, we want to see crowd therapy succeed. And we wanted to find the right partner that we thought, you know, hey, they can, you know, actually make cryotherapy, you know, help us scale this in America. So we were definitely willing to, I think, part with at least 40% equity. And that was probably our, our final limit was 40% okay. when we were going into Shark Tank. Wow. So with that, I heard you mention scale. I heard you mention, I think I visited your LinkedIn page and I saw the word franchise there. How are you guys scaling since being on the show or what are the plans for scaling in the next couple of years? Well, yeah, I mean, Therapy spas in the whole country. I'm pretty sure 15 of them were in Texas, so it was brand new, and we we're kind of you know inventing the game as you know we we're going along, making the rules and everything. And we just said this therapy works so well that it really should be in every single city. And uh, after a year, there's not 20 anymore. There's around 250 locations, so wow. it's growing as I expected it to. We wanted you know you know for franchise, you got to give people a reason to franchise with you. So you know there's a huge learning curve to crowd therapy. There's ways to market it, ways to get the therapy correctly and effectively and give that good experience. And we feel like we've mastered that. And since Shark Tank, we've received uh, probably over a thousand franchise requests. Wow. But, you know, your first 20 or so franchises are so important for setting up your future. They'd be very selective on who you choose and what locations you go into. But probably the most important thing that's happened is the vice president of a huge fitness club chain watched our Shark Tank episode called me two days after the show and said, hey, how would you like to put Gloss Day Cryotherapy inside of our fitness club? I said, absolutely. I love it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, right? I have all these franchise requests. And what's going to happen is uh, we're about to finalize a deal this week, actually. They have over 600 locations in the country. <laughs> and we can either put our own corporate locations or we can sell our franchise and have people buy into Gloss Day and open in these fitness clubs. So I think we're going to do probably both. But now we have something a little bit more proprietary to us. We don't make the equipment that we use. 
But if you want to go into this fitness club, you have to have Guase over wow. your name. Wow. So it is, it's definitely something that's going to help our brand in the future. Did I just hear you say basically that your brand tripled or quadrupled <laughs> in locations and is going to do that in one deal? Well, it, I think, it, you know, it gives us the possibility for it. It's just a huge opportunity. I mean, you know, we're going to do our best to execute and scale it into all 600 locations. But that's going to take some time and, you know, have to be done right. But we have a bunch of franchise requests. And once I'm able to, you know, present this to the franchise request we've already received, I think a lot of investors are going to jump all over it mm. because it's a huge opportunity to own your own business, get into a new therapy that's really taking off. And it's going to be a great model inside of this fitness club. Well, I tell you, I really, it really sounds like you guys are having some rocketing success. You know, definitely you and your sister. What's your sister's name? My sister's name is Brittany. Okay. We, we want to give Brittany some credit too, right? Because she, she like you said, she, she keeps you grounded. She a right? lot of it. <laughs> we wouldn't be where we are without her. I mean, if, if I didn't have her, I probably would have blown this thing all up because I'm so aggressive. <laughs> but she really, you know, she's uh, amazing at marketing. There's no one better at marketing and you know, as far as being organized, there was so much paperwork and phone calls and emails. And she is uh, absolutely amazing at keeping us uh, organized and on track. So without her, there would be no boss day. Awesome. That's without a doubt. Awesome. Well, and just in case you're just tuning in, we've been talking to Skylar Scarlett with Glossé Cryotherapy. Skylar, why don't you tell the listeners how to find out more about Glossé Cryotherapy? please visit us on our website, www.glossacryotherapy.com. It has a bunch of great information for individuals to check out. And also it has a great webpage on it that will discuss the franchising possibilities with us. And then also if you're in Carmel, California, my sister and I, we still operate on site at our Carmel location. If you want to meet us in person, you can definitely come in and I'm always happy to discuss Shark Tank and uh, entrepreneurial advice to anybody that walks in while I'm here, which I don't know how much longer that will be, but while I'm here, I'm definitely open to it. <laughs> awesome, man. Awesome. Skylar Scarlett. Hey, if you're in Carmel, California, stop by and say hello. Glossy Cryotherapy, thanks for taking your time out on Radio for Small Business. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our share all promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. All new radio for small business. Da, 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 da. Connect, capitalize, go. So here's what you should know. Nate Barbera and Desiree Stoller's business all started when someone accidentally put a favorite tan wool sweater in the dryer. You should know Desiree Stoller, <laughs> owner of Unshrink It, is on radio for small business right now. Desiree, thanks for taking your time out. Oh, you're welcome. So, you got to tell me, how old were you when you got the idea for Untrink It or the, I guess, the epiphany that sweaters don't go in the dryer? Sadly, I was 28 uh, when I realized that wool sweaters probably don't belong in the dryer ever. <laughs> so you, you got to tell the experience. Was it an emergency or did you just say, let's see if it works? Oh, it was negligent. <laughs> uh, when you're in graduate school, you're doing a million things at once. You're studying, you're on the phone, you're trying to do it too much at once. And I literally just put all my clothes together in the same pile and thought they would all come out nice and beautiful and clean. And to my surprise, the wool sweaters came out a couple sizes too small. Oh, boy. Which is a little disconcerting, considering that when you're in grad school, you don't have money to replace wool sweaters. <laughs> so I immediately started thinking, how can I rectify this? Because uh, the last thing I want to do is have to either not have a sweater, it's lost and it's full, or try to buy a new one. So I, I looked for home remedies and thought one worked really well. And I quote, un, 
unshrunk and grow sweater that I wore to class at Harvard Business School. And over the course of the day, it continued to shrink to the point where it was a crop top. So you're a grad student, you're doing 50 things at one time, and you throw your sweater in with all the other clothes into the dryer. What happened next? I said to myself, this can't stand. I need these sweaters back. I don't have the money to replace them. And I was shopping. I need to be studying. So I tried to find home remedies that would fix it. And I found one that I thought worked really well. And that was basically water and conditioner. And I fixed my sweater, went to class, and then proceeded to watch my sweater shrink back to a crop top in the middle of class at Harvard Business School, which is not appropriate. (laughs) So... I requested a jacket from a friend and then went home frustrated, but more importantly, determined to actually fix shrinkage in the laundry room. And that's where the yeah. idea for your business came from. So it's your business is unshrink it. Talk about the process where you say, OK, I'm going to become a mad scientist or what happened? Oh, uh, well, the process is that Harvard Business School had just launched a program where they would give students $5,000 to start a micro business. And I convinced my five other classmates that this would be a brilliant idea. Why not? We have the money and time to tinker around for a few months and try to crack the nut on shrunken wool clothing. And thankfully, they agreed with me that it'd be more fun to do than a mobile app or a website. And so we started doing some research on what makes wool shrink. And Nate had a background at Johnson Johnson during product development and was really comfortable looking at old wool textbooks and and researching the science behind things. And he proceeded to make a bunch of suggestions for things that could work. And as a team, we tested them out over a few months. So eventually you get a product and a business that's successful enough for you all to think about raising capital. Can you talk about that process where you decided to say, hey, we're going to bring on some new investors? Well, in many ways, the process was, the decision to raise capital did not come for a while. So the $5,000 that Harvard gave us basically lasted us through all the initial R&D, as well as the legal protections to file a patent. And it got us through the summer in incorporating the business. It was only in the fall where we realized that the product actually had demand beyond our family members and friends that we first did an internal round of fundraising amongst the founders because if you're not willing to put a little bit of skin in the game as a, a co-founder, then you know what are you doing? And that got us actually to the first sweater season, so September through May. We used our own funds hmm. to do that. It was only once we started to get interest from retailers and from international distributors that we said to ourselves, perhaps we should look for external <laughs> funding. Now, remind the fact that once we graduate from graduate school, we're going to have loans and bills and families to provide for, and we should probably try to cover a salary. So that was the catalyst to looking for capital, and we looked at it in all the most traditional places with angel investors, with accelerators, with families and friends, and with a couple of D.C. firms in the D.C. and Hmm. Boston area. So I like the way that you were getting interest from retailers and wholesalers and things like that, because that probably made your pitch a lot more appealing. How did, I guess, your experience with pitching venture capital firms and angel investors, how'd that help you when you got onto ABC's Shark Tank? Tremendously. (laughs) By the time we went on Shark Tank, we had already done close to 50 pitches in front of VCs, angels, professors, friends who were going into private equity and, and venture capital. And more importantly, we had fin- basically finished up our entire degree. So we, I mean, I literally had a diploma on the wall by the time I was filming at Shark Tank. So we, we thought as though you had the academic credentials behind you, but also a great deal of practice. Now, Shark Tank is a completely different animal, literally. The pressure of being on national television, the pressure of being in front of billionaires and right. multi-millionaires, the pressure of knowing that you have anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours to make an impression about your product or your service, and they're going to judge you either very harshly or at least very critically (laughs) about what you're doing. So you mean you you uh, weren't on the carpet for only that 12 minutes that they show it on the TV show? Oh, no. Nate and I were on that carpet for about two hours. (laughs) Do you at least get a bathroom break or something? I don't know. No, no, no. The The thought is that 
they don't want you to be able to go and look at notes or to confer with one another. It's really supposed to be you in the pressure cooker. What do you do in a moment of intensity to really sell your product and to sell yourself? So uh, you've made the pitch. You've made 50 pitches before you got to Shark Tank. You're standing on the carpet for two hours. Can you talk to us about not necessarily, you know, what was going through your, well, yeah, what was going through your mind? What's the mentality and mindset that you had to have in order to really repel all the different things that they would ask about your business and make sure you knew your numbers? What's the mentality you had to prepare for? It's a great question. I will tell you that the best thing that the mentality that served me best was frankly being exceptionally confident that I had a product that truly was worthwhile, that I myself was a person of integrity, and that our business, although not, not perfect to everyone, had a lot of strong qualities to it. So it's a sense of confidence mm. flying in. And I will tell you the first five minutes, they you feel buffeted left and right. They're asking you question after question. They're overlapping. There's a sense of impatience because their time is right. valuable and they want to find out as much as possible about you and the product as quickly as possible. And I recall thinking, I'm going to founder here if I don't get my bearings because I can't answer every question and I can't answer, I certainly can't answer overlapping questions. And so I told this to many people beforehand, and I'll just repeat it here, that I literally just stopped for a moment and thought to myself, well, if Mark, Kevin, and Damon ask a question at the same time, then why don't I listen to the questions, like truly breathe right. hmm. and listen and pick the question that I feel most prepared to knock out the ball park. Instead of trying to parse out who deserves to be answered first, answer wow. what I want. So I, there was a moment in which that literally happened where three or four people asked the same question. And I happened to hear Kevin's question come out in a way that I thought we had prepared it well and it was going to make us look great. So I answered it and he loved my answer. And to my surprise, so there's a momentary freak out session where you're thinking they're Damon and, and Mark, and I say, hey, you didn't answer my question. Instead, because my answer was so good to Kevin, they dropped their initial question and asked a follow-up hmm. to that hmm. one. So it created this wonderful domino effect where basically every question flowed from, from answers that I really had thought through how I wanted to answer it. And I thought we were going to represent us very well. And so it just continues to make us look better So you better, took control. And yeah, even though you, you weren't asking the questions, yeah. you took control in your mind and you said, hey, this is what we want to say about our business. And here it is. Here's the answer that I want to give you. Hmm, exactly. Okay. That's probably a good tip for anybody anywhere that's pitching, right? <laughs> I mean, well, it's great advice. It's hard to take. And I want to say had Nate and I not practiced 15, 20 hours a week for almost wow. two months on those questions, uh, pausing and playing different Shark Tank segments and making ourselves answer questions as if we were the founders wow. ourselves, of uh, creating fake, fake VC sessions where people grilled us for hours on end and we had to answer the questions. And if we didn't have that foundation of practice, I don't think I, I would have had the ball. Well, <laughs> but hey, you I, can say it. It's, it's, we're on the um, internet. It's, cool. it's okay. <laughs> Okay. I wouldn't have had the guts to do that. But because I knew if I did try to take control in it, I took control over things that I thought we were really well prepared to do um, to highlight our, ourselves. That was why I was gotcha. comfortable doing it. If you're, not, if you're not prepared, if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know your business, if you're trying to be a fake person, I can't tell you how many people you know said that they were going to try to be a persona on Shark Tank. And Nate and I no. said no. Hmm. Under pressure particularly under pressure for an hour or two hours, you eventually revert mm. to yourself. You might as well practice being yourself. Desiree, I've got to tell you, you are a very wise woman, okay? You oh, probably dropped you. five or six golden nuggets in this few minutes that we've been talking. And just in case you're just tuning in, we're talking to Desiree Stoller, co-founder of Unshrink It. You've seen them on Shark Tank. You've seen them in other national television shows. Desiree, why don't you tell the listeners how to get a hold of you? You can reach me at hi at unshrinkit.com, or you can go straight to our website, unshrinkit.com, and show out the information on the contact page. Awesome. Desiree Stoller, co-founder of Unshrinkit. Thanks for taking your time out on Radio for Small Business. You're welcome. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. 
Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Prophet. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our Share All Promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. All new radio for small business. Put your mouth where your money is. Radio for small business with Home of Biz. It's Radio for Small Business, HomeBiz.com. Your host, Eugene Rowe. My next guest has luggage that folds. I'm about to get on a plane literally right now, and we need to talk to Mr. Stephen Hirsch of Biagi. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you. So can you tell us a little bit, luggage that folds, okay, that's, uh, that's, that's something interesting. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your business and your products? Yeah, so Biagi makes uh, innovative travel products, not only luggage that folds, but other products that make travelers' lives simpler, but our core product, like you mentioned, is foldable luggage because, as you know, luggage takes up a lot of space in your home, uh, and this is an issue that nobody really has dealt with before we came along. Basically, we make uh, durable, uh, lightweight luggage that you can fold up and store easily in a drawer, on a shelf, under a bed. You know, things like that. And that makes sense. I literally have a whole corner full of luggage and you can't, you know, you can't fold it. You can't throw it under anything. And I've got a whole corner of one of my offices full with just empty yeah. luggage sacks. So that's a great idea. So uh, Thank you. What, what part of the world are you in, by the way? I live in New York. I know that eventually your business was able to get to the point where you were able to kind of start with raising capital and things like that, because I know some people have seen you on ABC's Shark Tank. Can you tell us about the journey to raising capital, not necessarily the show, but the journey that you took to starting to raise capital? So my company is uh, pretty much self-funded by me and my partners. Uh, We don't borrow. You know, that's really not our business model. We invest in our own business. We sell inventory once in a while. We'll borrow against purchase orders. If we get a big order from somebody, we might use a factor. You know, I don't know if you know what a factor is. I'm assuming you do. Yes, I do, yeah. I guess your listeners don't know what a factor is. Basically, you get an order from, from a company, like let's say I do business with QVC, for example. You know, they'll write me an order, and in order for me to be able to pay my factory before I get paid by them, I'll borrow against that purchase order. So, and that's interesting. Most people think you get an order from, say, for instance, a Target or a QVC or somebody, and they automatically send the money. But it could be quite a while before, you know, purchasers actually send you the cash, right? Yeah, it could be 60 days or even as much as 90 days. So when it comes to, I know you said you guys don't borrow necessarily. That's not your business model. There are probably a a million people that would call you crazy. Tell us about the the mindset or the thought process behind not borrowing against your company's assets. Every business is different, and I I wouldn't knock somebody for, for borrowing money. Most companies do it. I've done it with previous business as well, but ultimately... We changed our business model and we operate, you know, a very, very, very lean. We reinvest all of our, all of basically, you know, everything that, that we make, we reinvest in inventory and mm. uh, ultimately, ultimately it catches up, you know, in a, in a positive way. I mean, that's just the way we like to do it. Again, and, there's so many different business models that you could use. And you're able to sleep better at night, I'm guessing. Exactly. <laughs> we're talking to we're talking to Stephen Hirsch, uh, owner of Biagi on Radio for Small Business. Check it out on HomeBiz dot com. Connect, capitalize, go. Stephen, we've already talked about the mindset of raising capital. We've even talked about what factors are in when getting orders and things like that. Let's go back into you know the raising capital, more of the mindset when you ended up on ABC Shark Tank. What's going through your head, and what are you trying to get across to the sharks in order to uh, cash that check? My strategy with uh, getting on, on the show, uh, for getting on the show, not just for getting on the show, for having success on the show and trying to score a deal with one of the Sharks was basically to get a strategic partner. So I mentioned that we don't like to borrow money. The best alternative to that is to 
to have a partner who not only can help you with that with the money, but can also add more to the business. You know, instead of just borrowing somebody, you know, it could be somebody that helps you grow, like a bank will lend you money, and then you know, and, that, and obviously that helps you for sure if if you're going down that route 100. percent You know, every business needs capital in order to operate, but you know, the next level is to really. You know, I work with Lori Grenier, so not only does she invest in the company, but she also bought me some of my largest customers. Wow. You know, no bank's going to do that for you. And a lot of people don't think about that, right? So not only did, did did she get a piece of the company, but it's like you said, she's probably, now she's motivated to go get more business for you. I know she's got the QVC stuff. She's got the uh, Bed Bath & Beyond stuff. Can you talk more about the value of being able to have that value-add partner when it comes to bringing customers in the door? I mean, first of all, in my case, I happen to have a celebrity partner that helps me when I, whenever I meet with retailers or other customers that I'm trying to sell to. Obviously, you know that you know I could name drop, I guess, and that, <laughs> that definitely as uh, raising, being on the Shark Tank, even uh, borrowing, having to well, not having a business plan of borrowing, and then being able to factor as well. Stephen, with your you guys' this line of products, where are you seeing that uh, the most people are are liking it or loving it? What kind of feedback are you getting? We get great feedback. I mean, I, I, you know, I have a very niche niche product. It's, you know, luggage is a very broad category. It's not people don't travel necessarily that often, and there's so many different kinds of products in the category, and we sell a very specialized product. So our customers are very loyal customers. These are people who uh, really do, you know, feel that we solve a problem for them, and we get a lot of repeat business, which is obviously the ultimate feedback and oh, yeah. positive feedback that you could get. <laughs> They're definitely loving it then. Stephen Hirsch, owner of Biagi. Biagi.com. How do you spell that? B-I-A-G-G-I dot com. Okay. B-I-A-G-G-I dot com. Stephen Hirsch, thanks for taking your time out here at homebabiz.com. Thank you. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our share all promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. All new radio for small business. It's in capital. Fortunately, we learned enough in the military that has really applied to business to where we've been able to be successful. So I consider myself really fortunate for that. So obviously, you know, we see the, all the documentaries, we see the movies about U.S. Navy SEALs and things like that. What percentage or how much of that training it actually, you know, bred you to make sure you were going to be successful in business as well? A ton of it did. I mean, the first things first is they teach you accountability there. A lot of us think that we're grown up and mature, and then you get into a pressure cooker like SEAL training, and you realize that, you know, I'm really not as mature as I thought I was. They, they teach you right off the bat that excuses don't mean anything. We don't want to hear your excuses. We don't care why you're late. We don't care why you, you didn't make your time. And, it can, you know, that really translates over into business because you can have all the excuses in the world for mm-hmm. why your product, business, or your service isn't doing good. But at the end of the day, if you're not making money, then, you know, you're going to be out of business really soon. That was definitely valuable. The whole leadership thing was very valuable. We lead at every level. As special operators, we go into some of the most violent cities in the world you know, sometimes with, you know, four guys, sometimes 10 guys. And when you're doing that, you have to know that your leadership might get taken out, injured or killed. And so you have to know how to lead, step up and, you know, take care of business. And that's been hugely important involved. Wow. 
you know, there's there's a bunch of other things, and we could talk for hours on it, but those are just a few of the things that I've taken from the SEAL teams and applied to business. Well, first of all, we've been talking to Eli Crane, owner of Bottle Breacher. Eli, thanks for your service as a member of the U.S. Navy and the Navy SEAL, so we definitely thank you for that. Of course, here to talk to you today about your business, Bottle Breacher. Now, Bottle Breacher, that itself sounds exciting. Tell us about it. Absolutely. So I started this business um, out of my one-car garage in San Diego. I was honestly just trying to make something cool. Um, <laughs> when I realized I was on to something and then my buddies loved it, we uh, we were taking fifty caliber dummy ammunition and turning them into bottle openers. We did not come up with this idea. We just made this idea way better, and we, you know, applied a, sol- a solid branding to it. You know, Breacher, I wanted the brand to be something that stood out and something that, you know, people could get behind. And, you know, a Breacher in the SEAL teams is an operator whose job is to get us into whatever target we're hitting, Hmm. whether he does it explosively or mechanically. And so, you know, I knew you had to get into that bottle of suds somehow, so why not Breach it? So (laughs) Bottle Breacher got a nice nice ring to it, and, uh, you know, we've found that people, you know, have really gotten behind our Made in the USA, you know, better-known brand. That's right. Now, a lot of the, most of the product is actually made by U.S. veterans and U.S. citizens, right? Yeah, so we have, um, it's just to be completely upfront, we're, you know, we're not, our, our business isn't completely operated by veterans. We hire as many as, as, many as we can. Gotcha. Right now, we have, set, we have seven working for us. And so, um, you know, we're pretty proud of that fact. And all of our products are made right here in the USA, and we're extremely proud of that. That's pretty awesome. In fact, uh, I know that went over well when you were on ABC's Shark Tank, right? And uh, you were on their pitching capital. A lot of people think that show is just about a game show. But in essence, you were raising capital for your business. Can you talk about the mentality, the thought process that took you up to deciding to do that show? Well, you know, anybody that would sit there and watch a Shark Tank and think that it's just a reality TV show, first of all, I'll say this. We were projecting $800,000 in sales in 2014 before the shark tank after the shark tank we did over five million so if Whoa. people have to get obviously fifty thousand dollars 75 from mark cuban 75 from kevin o'leary but the other thing that you get is the exposure of the shark tank and you know that show is rerun constantly right in the united states all over the world and every time it gets rerun you know we get a, we see a spike in sales so it's it's been amazing that's pretty awesome we've we've been talking and we're still talking to Eli Crane of Bottle Breacher and I know we're talking about your experience on the Shark Tank millions of dollars of sales immediately after show, after the show so not only did you raise capital but there's how how many millions of dollars in just marketing that you get for your business whether you get a deal or not you know i don't know what the actual number is i've heard it, that type of exposure would cost you millions of dollars hmm. so one of the things that I went into the Shark Tank and one of my mantras was is that 70% of something is worth more than 100% of nothing. Okay. I would have given up 30% of my business, you know, for what I got. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners make is that they don't realize the value of taking on a oh. tactical partner who also can who also can infuse income and capital into your business. You know, they want to keep control over everything. You know, and they want a hundred. They want to be hundred percent owner, and that's great, and it's fine. But a lot of the times, hmm. they're never able to take their business to the next level because of it, and that's why I say they own hundred percent of nothing. <laughs> and that's a good thing to say. I remember hearing even Kevin O'Leary say that you know he had a problem with his original company that he sold to Mattel, and he brought in another guy to solve that problem, and he gave that guy equity, and as a result, what four four billion dollars later, uh, they were a multi billion dollar sale or something like that. So I, Absolutely. I, I, I definitely agree with that. So let's let's kind of switch gears just a little bit and w- preparing to get on to the show, not necessarily applying, but what's going what else is going through your head as far as preparing questions they might ask, things they may want to know, things that you need to still learn about your own business. What was going through your mind? You know, what was going through my mind is that we were only going to get one shot at this and, uh, I've had a lot of failures in my life. Most of them were because I didn't pr- properly prepare. Most of it was because I took kind of a lackadaisical, I'm going to do this kind of half-ass mentality. And I knew that wasn't going to work on the Shark Tank. So, you know, we knew, you know, nothing's worse than watching the Shark Tank and watching entrepreneurs fumble through their pitch and then not being able to answer questions. So I definitely sought out as many advisors, you know, 
it had solid reputations that had been there, done that, and had been successful in multiple businesses. And I just had them put me through the pressure cooker. You know, I would have the, I would bring these guys in, and I would have them grill me and Jen, you know, for hours at a time, asking us any and every question that they could think of, and then we would do it again. Wow. And you know, that was so important to our success on Shark Tank because you know you see about probably eight or nine minutes of it on television but what you don't realize is, is that me and jen were in the tank for an hour and 20 minutes Ouch. getting grilled so we, we got a hundred for that investment should be itself the other the other half of that investment and deal should be based on the warm and fuzzy you get on the people behind it and that's what i wanted the sharks to understand that jen and i had faced a lot of adversity and when we faced it we didn't run for the hills you know we fought strong and we had to after the shark tank you know we had a three month back order we had you know for sure a customer service problem because hmm. you know we did a mil- million dollars in sales in the first week oh. you know so you don't go from manufacturing your own product and making 130 units on a good day to <laughs> having to make 1500 to 2000 on the next day and not have any issues that just doesn't happen wow. and so you know we were thankfully as a company we were able to get through that we rallied around one another. We thought outside the box. We brought in new innovation, and you know we solved the problem. And because of it, we, we're still in business today. Well said, Eli Crane, owner of the Bottle Breacher. Where can listeners pick it up? Go to bottlebreacher.com. Um, all of our all of our products are right there. They're all made in the USA. We support a lot of veteran nonprofits. You know, I couldn't be any happier to do what I do on a daily basis. Thanks for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you. We appreciate your service. Eli Crane, owner of Bottle Breacher. Thanks for taking your time out on HomeBizBiz.com. Thank you. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our Share All Promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. All new radio for small business. It's Radio for Small Business. Your host, Eugene Rowe. Check us out on HomeBiz.com. Connect, capitalize, and go. And if you're planning on going on an adventure, you'll want to listen to this next guest, Andy Cochran, owner of Oru Kayak. Welcome to Radio for Small Business. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Andy, now, I'll tell you, I've been on water in water sports uh, maybe once. I was in a canoe. I know you guys do kayaks. you got to tell me, which one's easier, the canoe or the kayak? It really depends what you're doing, man. Canoes are good for one thing, and kayaks are good for another. Well, we were beginners, so... <laughs> Typically, you know, used for carrying more gear over longer distances. You can throw in multiple packs or a couple kids, a dog. Kayaks are generally quicker. They turn faster, better for rivers, and really... A lot better for oceans or surf. Depends what you're doing. Beginners, I, I've heard we should have definitely started with the kayak. I wish I had known about your business before then because it wasn't long before we were in the water. We maybe were in the the actual canoe for five minutes, but we were in the water for a little bit longer than that before we could climb out. So uh, I definitely tell you, how'd you get the motivation or the inspiration to really start your business? The inspiration from the business, not mine. So I, I lead marketing here. Our lead designer founded the business number of years ago we're talking eight or nine years ago and he is an architect by trade and he was doing architecture with a material called chloroplast which is uh, basically a plastic cardboard so he's pretty familiar with this type of material he's also a pretty avid kayaker and he moved from northern Minnesota uh, sorry northern California down to San Francisco down to the Bay Area and in that move he moved into a small apartment and couldn't keep his kayak 
So he threw it in storage, and, you know, this is kind of something he didn't like. He, you know, would rather be out paddling every once in a while. Right. He read an article in the New Yorker about origami and had one of those kind of cliche aha moments where he, you know, started believing he could make a kayak out of out of this plastic that he used a lot using origami folding technique. So um, th- so the actual kayak actually folds and stores a lot better than, than anything else that's out there right now. Yeah, yeah, it's totally different. We don't really we don't have a competitor on the market. Our boat folds to one sheet of plastic. Uh, there's three different models. Um, either you can get them in either 12 or 16 feet long, and it folds down into a case that you can check on a plane. You can carry on your back. You know, fit, fit fit in the trunk of your car. So it folds down pretty small. Something that you know makes it a lot more portable. Awesome. We're talking to Andy Cochran with Oru Kayak. Now, Andy, I know eventually uh, it was time to maybe raise on, raise some capital and build some funds. Are you, can you talk to us a little bit about how the company maybe brought on some investors or at least pitched a few investors? So we have raised funds actually in a number of ways now. So we uh, have dabbled in crowdfunding. We launched initially in 2012 in the fall uh, with a Kickstarter campaign. Okay. That was Roughly three, give or take, years of development before that. So there's, you know, there's substantial resources, both human and financial, that go in before that of um, developing this boat. Probably 25 prototypes worth of, you know, testing and refining and iterating. We launched on on Kickstarter in 2012. At that time, we were the largest outdoor Kickstarter ever, roughly two thirds of a million. Um, Use that money to set up a factory, to bring on a dev team, to build out a website, to hire three or I guess pay the three founders. Um, at least enough to get by while the company started to grow. Mm-hmm. Since then, we've gone through a couple rounds, small and mostly with, with angels, friends and family, but still have used that money each time for very specific needs. So it's not just like, you know, this spring we're going to go out and raise money to, to grow. It's like we need a certain a certain machine I gotcha. or, you know, a certain mold for injection molding in the factory, you know, or we're going after a distribution center in Europe. Let's raise, you know, whatever it is, 400K for that. Right. Do you always have very specific criteria? Because investors don't like just giving money for the sake of giving you money. They want to know where their cash is going, right? Right, exactly. I mean, investors, you know, a better way, I think, to reframe investment is just an accelerator. Like, the smartest thing you can say to an investor and make sure it's true is is that you're going to get there regardless of their support or not. It's just their money is going to get you there faster. Hmm. So if you think if you reframe it like that as an accelerator, you know any of those things would have happened, or you know still in the future will happen for Oru. We just take on that money, uh, make it happen, earn money from it, and pay it back. Gotcha. Uh, it's, it's a better way to think about it. Gotcha. Andy Cochran of Oru Kayak is on radio for small business right now. Homebiz dot com. Connect, capitalize, go. Andy, you mentioned raising funds from friends and family, and by now you've got a little bit of experience. What are some tips that you can give other entrepreneurs who may be thinking about asking Uncle Ted for a few thousand dollars? It's a great question. So, like I mentioned to you a bit ago, we've done it through crowdfunding and through angels, and we've also been on, actually appeared on Shark Tank. That's right, uh, that's right, yes. So we've danced that dance too. The advice I'd give for even asking is to really do your homework and, and see if you need to ask for it. You know, people are really intrigued by raising money, and here in the Bay we see it a lot. And one of kind of the, the most salient, the most important pieces of advice I've gotten in my career is do not take investment if you, do not, if you don't need it. Hmm. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's um, essentially it's giving up control of your company and, and not in a you know, selfish, you need everything type of way. But right. And having autonomy to make business decisions rapidly without a large board, without investors to dictate some of that is really helpful. And, you know, that's a piece of advice I, I got and heeded and it's been uh, important for, for me and us is to... So when we didn't need it, don't take it. So, Andy, you know, uh, most entrepreneurs, they'll say, of course, I need money right now. We want a widget or something like that. How do you right. talk them down off the ledge to help them be real with themselves about whether or not they need to go raise capital? Uh, well, I would explain to them that if, if their product cannot isn't profitable by itself, uh, then taking money now is only going to put them in a larger problem of uh, hmm. You know how to how they work themselves out of that. So <laughs> it's, it's it's only going to make you 
struggle more, uh, you know, you'll be paying that back and trying to stay in the black at the same time, uh, you know, which kind of complicates or almost you know, doubles that problem. So we, I mean, we see most of, you know, people around us, that it's almost the fastest way to sink yourself is to take on, you know, a, a large investment that you can't pay back. Um, and, you know, it seems so intriguing because it's cash up front and you can make moves right now, uh, you know, and you're the new cool kid on the block that raised, you know, such and such amount. Um, but eventually you got to pay the piper, money. right? <laughs> right. So, you know, I, I would, my methodology is, is uh, to do small prototyping all the time. So if people are, you know, have really validated their product, you know, that they can execute it, that the market really demands it, um, and they've done, you know, sufficient testing in that sense through real pilot, you know, getting it in people's hands, selling it in, you know, small exclusive runs, uh, and they know the demand's there, they know they can manufacture it, or they can build it if it's software. Um, then, yeah, I mean, then you can you can look at yourself, you know, honestly in the eye and say, cool, I'll take investment, I'll accelerate this business to the next step. Okay. Um, but until you've done that due diligence, hmm. um, it seems a little risky to me. Stay away from it, and, right? And not, <laughs> and not risky in a good way. You know, there's good risk. Uh, in business decisions, and then there's just dumb risk. <laughs> I like the way you said it. Andy Cochran, owner of Oru Kayak. Uh, why don't, what's the website? Give the listeners the website. Uh, the website is orukayak.com. That's O-R-U and kayak, which is spelled K-A-Y-A-K.com. Andy Cochran, Oru Kayak. Thanks for taking your time out here on homebabiz.com. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our share all promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. All new Radio for Small Business. It's Radio for Small Business on HomeBiz.com. My next guest is probably the smartest one I've ever talked to, okay? Mark Melney with Melney Connectors. I've got to tell you right now, welcome to the show, and you're definitely smarter than me, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to bet on that, but go ahead. <laughs> I would bet on it. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Melanie Connectors and the great things that you all do. We are in, in the essence of an invention company. I started this uh, this company about five, six years ago. I, my invention, I, I, uh, I had this invention in 2007, 2008, um, patented it, and received hmm. our patent in 13 months. So we had an issued patent, which was probably one of the fastest patents you know ever wow. <laughs> it was is that unusual incredible. to get a patent that quick no 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 not at all matter of fact uh in 2010 we went to boise uh, idaho and we we participated in a what they call the tech launch seven it was the uh, entrepreneur of the year slash vendor of the year and we won that contest when we when we did i i mean it, it opened up the the door for uh, you know, a lot of things looking at our company just as, as an invention company. Wow. And, and so the, the, the nature of my invention is it's really disruptive. It's, uh, the electrical industry has been uh, going on for 60, 70 years doing the same type of, of connections hmm. between their cables and their wires. And you know what that is. Uh, this is, would be a, a crimp. And you saw it on the show. It was, it's, a, it's a regular piece of pipe that you take a very heavy pair of pliers, you squeeze it down, that pipe squeezes down on top of the conductors, and that, that gives you your, your connection really? between you know, two cables. Yeah, that's, that's the standard crimp. And then in the industry, they take this, this crimp, which is a piece of metal. Again, it looks kind of like a metal pipe. And then they wrap it with tape, 
uh, cambric tape or, or, or you know, the, the different types of tapes that they have, electrical tape, and to make it uh, moisture-proof or environmentally, uh, <laughs> you know, insulated from the, uh, you know, from, from the ground, etc. Wow. So what my invention does is it, it as the uh, two conductors come into each other, inside of my uh, connector on the product or the service or the business you've seen him on abc mentioned that the current electric industry basically they're using a piece of metal and some tape i mean if i know this i could be rich because half the appliances in my house used to be like that okay (laughs) (laughs) so now your your connectors your inventions are revolutionizing the electrical industry and and like you said it's offering a faster safer more cost-effective way uh to transfer power now as a as a consumer what does that mean to me on the consumer side we are going to, right now we're concentrating on our commercial activities you know they, they, it, it's we feel that the best way to enter this marketplace is through the, 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 the commercial area because the the people that are going to be using it the electricians the linemen these are the guys that really know their products when it gets into their hands and you start, it's going to be kind of the, the trickle-down effect where the, the professionals are saying, okay, this is the right way to go, and then it's going to go towards the, the residential and the home market. Um, the very first device, just, just to give you an idea of the simplicity uh, for making the connector with the Melody connector as opposed to a, uh, a standard 4 aught what I described before, the 4 aught crimp that you have to use these huge you know, crimpers or whatever to do. Mm. My wife, uh, Mary, she made the very first uh, 4 aught connection with a Melody uh, connector using a pair of pliers, you know, tightening it down and, uh, and then tightening down the, uh, the end caps, which, which, which allow the, uh, the insulator to be a part of the connector so that it literally uh, is, has a positive uh, rejection of moisture and environment and stuff like that. So that gives you an idea how it, it will start going towards the residential. So as, as it gets picked up more commercially, eventually I as a consumer will be able to see some benefit. Well, I won't see it probably, but I'll get the benefit of it, right? You will be able to, to, to see it at your different outlets like, you know, the typical do-it-yourself outlets like Lowe's and Home Depot and True Value. Uh, this is going to be our next area that, that we're going to be releasing this into. Now, some of our products, you, you've seen the ones that were on the show, and I, uh, we have a vast array of products that go all the way from a battery a, a terminal connector that would go on top of your, uh, your automotive or, or truck or bus battery to start the vehicle all the way down to a Romex-type connector uh, that would be used in, inside the home. Uh, and you, it, I don't know uh, what, you've, what you've done electrically, but you know what a wire nut is? Uh, by ideal, is, is a, they're, they're the, the small nuts that when you put up a fan inside your, your house or you put in a light fixture, those little little nuts that you take the wires, you stick them inside and you twist them down. Oh, is that what that is? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a wire. It, it, it's known as a wire nut. That's a trademark by ideal. Uh, and and it's, it, it, it's uh, you know, there, there's, there's a trillion of those little guys sold around the world every year. Hmm. And and that's a marketplace that, to me, that's that's really where uh, I, we, we need to be there. Uh, that's one of my inventions in my very first patent was okay. a, I call it the zap nut, which is zero application pressure, but it literally slides over the top of the conductors, let's say three or four conductors that you would be tightened together just like you would in a light fixture, and then you would twist about a quarter turn to a half turn twist on my zap nut, and then it, 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 it collapses the, uh, the, the internal workings of, of the insert, and then boom, it, it goes around the conductors, and it, it has a higher pull rate than a standard wire nut. Now, you mentioned that, uh, obviously, that you want the commercial side on. W- with that, the professionals are going to be vouching for you, and when you raised capital, right, you took a, a professional 30-year veteran lineman on to the ABC Shark Tank. Tell us about the process, not necessarily yet of the show, but some of the things that you prepared for to prepare for the questions that you would have to answer. I'll tell you, that's the best part. It is really the best part. I mean, when Shark Tank contacted, first of all, the the odd part about this this whole thing was that we got contacted by Shark Tank. Wow. It wasn't the, yeah. It, we were, uh, originally they told us there was 42,000 applicants for season six. Um, in Boise, uh, I was invited to introduce uh, Robert Hershevik, uh to the Boise Business uh, Convention. So I got to spend actual, you know, some private time with with Hershevik and, and wow, what a cool guy! He was the original shark that I was, 
you know I wanted to 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 partner with because mm. I, I just I, you know he's kind of a fun kind of a guy. He seems like that on the and, show, yeah. Yeah, he does, and in, in real life, he he is. He's very. Po- I've read his book, and it was it was probably one of the best uh, books moving forward for for business people to look at it. It, it has more of a serendipity type of uh, you know, hard work, but but you know letting you know letting your 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 bliss kind of lead you towards you know the end. But anyway, I, I sat and talked with him, and he explained some of the insides of the show that was out. Standing, uh, it wasn't forty-two thousand. It was one hundred and twenty thousand applicants. Omg! <laughs> when, I know they added. He, he was explaining that that what what we were looking at the the was the the actual people that were you know sending in the emails and sending in all these uh, applications were about forty-two thousand. The one hundred and twenty thousand came from the different cities. These guys, the producers, go out to Chicago, to L.A., to you know New York, okay. whatever. And they have these casting calls where, where, where people will come in and show their inventions. So Hershevek was explaining to us the show has has just incredibly gone, uh, you know. It's all, a they, wonderful they, show, they, yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, they've gone into 20 English-speaking countries now. So, wow. so we get calls literally last week. We got four uh, emails from large distributors in India. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, these people want to sell our product, and, and, and we've gotten Brunei, we've gotten... Uh, Australia, New Zealand, all these English-speaking countries that, that see my product, they want to sell it. So the show has been outstanding. Now, when they first called us, and I said, that's great, I wanted to bring you know four guys with me. Uh, the one representative from the Northwest Lyman's College, which is, a, uh, they produce uh, a lot of your power linemen across the country and Canada, etc. Hmm. And then also uh, Byron Dunn, who was uh, the, that lineman that was on the show. Right. 30-year man who's put over, you know, uh, he's figured between five and 10,000 of these crimps in his 30-year period, which is not a bad way to think about it. Right. He's probably more like three to 5,000. But anyway, <laughs> this guy is amazing. He's a maverick. So he, when he saw my product, uh, he, uh, at first, I went on to his, his blog and I said, hey, I've got a new product. His secretary sent back said, "Look, you cannot advertise your product on our blog." And then I said, "Well, it's, this is more of a, you know, here's a safety item, and here's something I just want to get people's opinion on it." So then I said, "Let me talk to the boss." I talked to to Byron, and uh, you know, at first he was just, okay. Send me one. Let me take a look at it. Gotcha. Yeah. I sent him one. I uh, did the things, and then you know, after he looked at it and experimented, boom, he wants to invest in the product, and and you know, he he was so excited about. It. He still is. I mean, he's our number one fan. <laughs> He's brought all the linemen into that. So that right there, that as an investment goes, it was when he saw it and he's been around it for a long time. Boom! He dropped uh, fifty grand into the uh, you know invention. That says a lot from somebody with that type of experience in the industry, and that You're brought you a right. lot of cat- a lot of credibility on the show, didn't it? Well, that's it. And that the, the producers. Here's the part that that people that that was amazing to us, but it it, it worked out very you know it worked out great. The producer, Mark Burnett's office, called and said, no, you can't bring Byron. You can only go just the two of you, and that's what that's what your finances are for. I said to the, the producer, I said, look, I'll pay for Byron to go. Let me, let, let's take him. He's a, you know, it's really important. And then she said, no, you, know, you can't do that. So then I said, okay, I have to renege. I have got to, you know, I we're not going to be able to make the show. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I know, and at this point, we're we're down to the very, I mean, they've already got our flights and all this other stuff, and that's when, when they told us this bad news about Byron. She said, that's never happened. We don't, that you, you don't get to this stage and then say you're not coming. And Especially said, for the Shark Tank, right? They're like, hey, it's what's going on? Straight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, this is, they, they'd already sent us out papers to our attorney stating that if we make the show, that we're that we would have on on media digital advertising of the approximation of about 1.6 million dollars worth of of media advertising. Hmm. So it's like saying no to that. Hmm. Okay, and, and and at that point I just and I said no to her, and I told her this is it. So she said to me, she said, "Why is he so important?" I said, "Look, let's say that you, a producer of a you know a reality television show, a great show, and me, a, a you know a half." I hate to say it, but a half-assed piano player <laughs> who, who who owns a computer company, and, and, you know, we're sitting there trying to tell the world's greatest VCs at this point about a product, an electrical product, that oh. neither one of us are an electrician. <laughs> and then I have Byron Dunn, 
who has been 30 years in the industry, owns his own magazine that, that, that caters to the Power Lineman. As a matter of fact, it's called Power Lineman Magazine. And this guy, with the minute he saw it and started working with it, invests money in it. Who do you want? If, if you and I were trying to sell this invention, ma'am, to these people, well, who wouldn't you want this sense? guy to be on the show? Right. And then she said to me, okay, he's on, wow. just like that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and then looking back at it, I mean, I've got uh, with the first – when we first hit, uh, first 48 hours, we had 72,000 emails that came in. <sighs> we had 8.2 million people watch the show, according to the stats. And it, it yeah, it was, we were in the April season, so it's, it's while, you know, it kind of builds up as it goes along, you know. So anyway, after getting all those hits and stuff, it was unanimous that Byron Dunn sold the whole thing. Wow. Wow. I mean, as far as I was concerned, they gave, I mean, when we were sitting there, and, and you know, I, I really like the, the sharks. I like all of them. I, Mr. Wonderful's a little bit weird, but <laughs> Barbara <laughs> Cochran, she's sitting there, and she looked at us, and she said, Byron, I give you an A+. Plus. You know, I, I kind of think the two of them had a thing going on there, but anyway. <laughs> she looked over at Armand, my partner, and she says to him, she says, Armand, I give you a C. And Armand just kind of says, what? And then she looked at me, and she says, Mark? And she shook her head, and I said, well, come on, give me something, you know? So it was it was an amazing uh, thing. And, and it, it, the way it worked out with Byron there, he was able to answer technically any question these guys would have. That and, helped out a huge bit, didn't it? That helped out. Yes, it did, because we were out there for almost two hours. Wait a yeah, minute. It wasn't just a few minutes that, that I saw you guys on the segment? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm two glad hours. You him with and, and, and it was it was it was kind of grueling, especially for me because you know they're trying to figure out our backgrounds and and I, the same thing I said to the producer. What you know, I I don't have a background in elect, electronics. I mean, you know, wow. <laughs> just the way it goes. <laughs> so hey, Mark, we've been talking to Mark Melney, owner inventor of Melney Connection Connections, Melney Connectors. Mark, uh, what's your what's your website so that more people can find out about you? Uh, it is www.melneyconnectors.com, or easier to me is melney.org. Melney.org. Mark Melney, thank you for taking your time out on homebabiz.com. Thank you very much for the, for reaching out and talking to us. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our Share All Promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the share all promise. All new Radio for Small Business. It's Radio for Small Business on HombaBiz.com. Your host, Eugene Rowe. Thanks for tuning in right now. i got somebody who's got a firm grasp of the market. Ashley Drake with The Natural Grip. Welcome to Radio for Small Business. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about what The Natural Grip is, and and then I'm going to get into some more specifics. All right, sounds great. Yeah, the Natural Grip is an innovative hand protection device that protects you from ripping and tearing while working out. So we're the only custom hand protection on the market, and what that means is we're the only hand protection that's made based off of your ring finger size. It allows for a custom fit and the ultimate protection to keep you uh, from ripping and tearing while doing high-intensity barbell movements or pull-ups or things like that. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I saw you guys on TV quite a few times in quite a few places. Tell us about some of the experiences that, you know, some of the reasons that uh, I guess people who work out would need it as far as, you know, not ripping skin. Does it really make that big of a difference? Yeah, definitely. I mean, our primary market is the CrossFit uh, market, the functional fitness space. Also, gymnasts use our product. Uh, Even landscapers can. So it's anybody that's in an environment where they're 
going at such a rate of speed as far as like barbell cycling or pull-ups or uh, different movements that causes a lot of friction and mm. can cause for your hands to rip or tear. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, where'd you come up with the, with the concept? Well, ultimately, I mean, I was having that problem, and so um, my husband, I got sick of listening to me complain about <laughs> my hands ripping and tearing while working out, mm. and uh, he he knew that I had tried everything out there on the market and that nothing was working for my small hands. And so he said that um, he thought he could make something to solve my problem, and he did just that, and some other people saw it at the gym and went crazy about it and wanted to buy it, and so that's when that magical light bulb moment, you know, happened, and I I thought, well, hey, maybe we have something here. Really, it's wonderful to hear entrepreneurs and business owners talk about them having something that they're using and everyone else gets excited about it. Was it 5, 10, 15, 20 people who said, hey, this is pretty cool, you got to give it to me before you decided that it might be a business opportunity, or was it more than that? You know, honestly, it was one person. It was one person that I had never met before. Um, we had we were starting to work out at the gym, and it was 100 pull-ups for time, and she was in from out of town, and she got emotionally distraught about the workout, and I had never met her before, and I asked her if she was okay, and she said, yeah, I'm just worried. I'm going to rip and tear my hands, and I said, oh, try these things my husband made, and um, after the workout, she like came sprinting towards me, and I didn't know if she was mad at me or happy with me. I didn't really know what was going on, and um, she said that um, she wanted to know where I got them, how could she get more of them, she wanted to pay me for them, and it was just that authenticness of how she had the same exact problem I was having, but I had solved it for her, hmm. and it was just a life-changing moment for her where it was just on her face that she couldn't have been more thankful. Wow. And when you have one of those kind of interactions with somebody, I mean, it definitely you know stuck in my head for the rest of the day, and all I could think about was, okay, how can I tell my husband about this where he can see how how important it was to her you know mm. because he wasn't there to witness it happen and wow. uh so when I went home that night and I told him you know when we were sitting in the kitchen making dinner you know he thought I was crazy he was like <laughs> no one's gonna buy these things that's ridiculous Ashley and so I just said well let, let me try let's let me try what what do we have to lose if I don't if I don't take any of our money you know out of our savings if I just start a Facebook page you know just let me try and and so that's he said, sure, go right ahead. No one's going to buy them. And here we are three, almost four years later and, you know, over a million in sales. So wow. <laughs> things, things can escalate quickly. So. We're talking to Ashley Drake of the Natural Grip right here on HomeBizBiz.com. It's radio for small business where you connect, capitalize, and go. Ashley, you talked about how your husband actually created the product. Now, do you guys work the business together or is it pretty much your baby that you run with? Well, I am the CEO. There's no doubt about that. Um, he is the COO, Chief of Operations. I'm actually still active duty, so I work full-time for the Army, um, and so I'm not able to really focus on the business stuff until uh, later in the afternoon when I'm done with my Army requirements. And Justin runs the, the production facility from 9 to 5 every day um, or later if necessary. Gotcha. So um, we're both fully committed, but um, you know he runs the day-to-day -day stuff, and I I kind of handle the high-level stuff. Gotcha. Now, if I'm not mistaken, when you were on Beyond the Tank, uh, I, I watched mm -hmm. that show a whole lot. I know you were thinking about making a big decision as far as the full-time uh, job goes. Has anything else changed with right. that since then? Yeah, no. I mean, I had made the decision um, to get out of the military, uh, and so that's been um, communicated to the Army, and they're tracking that. It just takes time for that to kind of go through the process. So my commitment's not up until next October, and so I'll fulfill my commitment that I have um, for my term of service, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and transition out. It's just um, it's not something anybody should take lightly, and it takes time. Um, so uh, that's why that was a topic then, but still hasn't, you know, been executed yet. Absolutely. absolutely. We're talking to Ashley Drake of The Natural Grip. HomeBiz.com, connect, capitalize, go. Ashley, you mentioned something about, uh, you know, wanting to quit the full-time job, and your job is actually more important than probably most of all others out there. A member of the United States Army, we thank you for your service. So, what were some of the, the, the things and details that you had to think about and consider before you decided to walk away from that safety net, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, definitely getting paid on the 1st and the 15th, you know, an officer's salary is a, a big thing to walk away from. I mean, ultimately, the business does play a role in it. But in addition to that, um, we have a, a daughter, she's five years old. And so becoming um, a mom and continuing in the service is a, is a difficult 
uh, decision point kind of for any female soldier um, mm. enlisted or or on the officer side. So uh, I tell everybody, you know, the the company has played a role in the decision, but ultimately um, I want to be there for our daughter. And I've, I'm very thankful for the military career that I've had, and I know that I could go very far in the military, but I also um, take my responsibility of being a mother very seriously. And, um, you know, your priorities change as you get older and things things change in your life. So um, Ellie is more important than my Army career, and therefore... Wow. Mm -hmm. I need to I need to focus on that. I don't think anyone will fault you for making that decision. Definitely a member of the armed forces. Even, you know, my father and both of my brothers have served in different branches of the military. So definitely thank you for your service with that. We're talking with Ashley Drake of the Natural Grip. Now, you mentioned something three, four years in to the business, a million dollars in sales later. I mean, you go back to your husband saying it'll never sell when you sold your first six figures. What do you say? Uh, he, he said, uh, well, he said, okay, now what? And I said, well, we keep going, you know, I mean, it was just kind of like that. He, um, you know, he was skeptical at first, but you know, when we started the business in May of 2013, by the end of that year, we had done 60,000 in sales. And so that was kind of the moment like, oh man, you know, this is legitimate. We got to worry. The tax man's going to be interested in this, you know, <laughs> um, we've got to be interested in this, you know, what are we going to do? And it was really a decision point, you know, were we going to walk away or, or where are we going to continue on that path? And, um, you know, luckily my husband had the opportunity where he could, you know, change his profession and take the production on full time. So, uh, he's he's just as committed as I am to making this um, making this successful. And every day we're surprised, um, you know, by by the growth of the company. And but we're putting in the level of work that it takes to make that a reality. And uh, hmm. you know, there's no there's no wasted time in our family. So um, <laughs> we're we're here we're here as long as it takes. And uh, plus some. So so why yeah. don't you tell the listeners how to get more information about the natural grip? Yeah, the best the best way is social media. Um, we are very active on all of our social platforms: Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. If you're just interested, kind of want to check us out or start following us, I highly recommend you know at the Natural Grip, and uh, we're on all those platforms. And then also you can check out our product on our website www.thenaturalgrip.com, and and you can order a pair for right there from our website. Awesome. Ashley Drake with the Nash Natural Grip CEO, might I add, right here. Thank you for taking your time out on HomeBiz.com. Thank you for having me. Connect. Capitalize. Go. Hi, I'm Eugene Rowe, host of the podcast for business. On behalf of our team, I'd like to say thanks. Every month, we're able to impact thousands of lives all over the globe with relevant, impactful, and insightful guests. Some of them have even been featured on national television shows like ABC's Shark Tank and CNBC's The Profit. Our mission is simple, to journey with you on your road to achievement. To do that, I'd like to invite you to partner with us in our Share All Promise. I promise to continually share for free without commercial interruption and unnecessary subscriptions. And I ask that you promise to share us with your friends. Here's something you like. Simply use the social share buttons at the bottom of the page to tell your network about the podcast for business. It's simple, easy, and only takes five seconds. That's it, partner. You've made the Share All Promise. All new Radio for Small Business. It's Radio for Small Business on HomeBiz.com. Your host, Eugene Rowe. Thanks for tuning in right now. i got somebody who's got a firm grasp of the market. Ashley Drake with The Natural Grip. Welcome to Radio for Small Business. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about what The Natural Grip is, and, and then I'm going to get into some more specifics. All right, sounds great. Yeah, the Natural Grip is an innovative hand protection device that protects you from ripping and tearing while working out. 
So we're the only custom hand protection on the market. And what that means is we're the only hand protection that's made based off of your ring finger size. So it allows for a custom fit and the ultimate protection to keep you uh, from ripping and tearing while doing high intensity barbell movements or pull ups or things like that. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I saw you guys on TV quite a few times in quite a few places. Tell us about some of the experiences that, you know, some of the reasons that uh, I guess people who work out would need it as far as, you know, not ripping skin. Does it really make that big of a difference? Yeah, definitely. I mean, our primary market is the CrossFit uh, market, the functional fitness space. Also, gymnasts use our product. Uh, Even landscapers can. So it's anybody that... um, in an environment where they're going at such a rate of speed as far as like barbell cycling or pull-ups or uh, different movements that causes a lot of friction and Mm. can cause for your hands to rip or tear. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, what did you come up with with the concept? Well, ultimately, I mean, I was having that problem, and so... Um, my husband, I got sick of listening to me complain about <laughs> my hands ripping and tearing while working out, mm. and uh, he he knew that I had tried everything out there on the market and that nothing was working for my 